So we've been talking about leadership and courage a lot this morning. We've shared some stories of those among us who have answered that call. I just want to personally thank you, everyone here today, for your support. We're all in this together, and we're proud of WCB to be your political voice for the environment, and that responsibility is the core of our mission. Very pleased to introduce our keynote speaker today, Jim Whitaker. Um, Jim, of course, uh, is a native Washingtonian who was propelled into fame as the first American to summit Mount Everest in 1963, returning later to the Himalayas to K2, and then uh, again as a leader as the, uh, the famous Earth Day peace climb in 1990. Um, and Jim, to tell you, on a, I haven't told you this, on a personal note, I read your book um, as a young man. And it was one of those stories that inspired me to reach higher and to climb higher, literally and figuratively. But um, you've always been a source of inspiration to me. I'm really excited to have you here with us this morning. What strikes me about Jim um, and his wonderful wife, Diane, who's with us this morning, is that their entire lives have been about the natural world around us. Um, fewer know that Jim actually was the first full-time employee of REI and its first CEO. So his personal life, his business life, it's really been about the, the world and making it a, a better place. I should say, too, that um, Jim and his wife, Diane, uh, graciously, graciously offered some of uh, his books this morning, the same book that inspired me, and all the proceeds go to Washington Conservation Voters. If you haven't read it, check that out on the way outside. I believe they're signed, too, right, Jim? Yeah. So climbing actually is just the beginning of Jim's story, and there's, there's so much there. Um, such a wonderful man. We're inspired by you, uh, and so grateful to have you this morning. Please welcome Jim Whitaker. Thank you very much, Ben, and a very, it's a pleasure to be here uh, speaking to uh, kindred spirits, uh, people that belong to the same choir, and uh, we're delighted. I'd like to have my wife, Diane, stand up. Uh, she's <laughs> we're companions in adventure. Uh, we've been married 38 years, so we're also endangered species. But uh, the Northwest, we're so lucky to be here. I look at our political landscape and I look at the flat south uh, where the highest uh, elevations are landfills and think of how else can those people think when they've just got that flat, barren <laughs> land down there. I feel sorry for the poor souls. I, they don't know any better and I think a good part of life is education. You've got to educate the people about what nature is, uh, what uh, the real planet uh, looks like, and what uh, some people have learned about it. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's really great to be here and, and to uh, see some friends, Governor Dan, uh, out there. And uh, I think there are a few people, probably Dan, not as old as us, uh, but Nevertheless, we're the elders, as the Indian tribes say, we're the elders, and so we're speaking with authority about some of the things that we know. I'd like to read a quote when I thought, oh, when Brendan invited me to talk to the environmentalists uh, here, the people that vote for the best leaders that we have, I thought, oh yeah, I've got a quote, I've got to read these people. M most of you probably have read it, but it's Edward Abbey's uh, quote. <clears throat> One final paragraph of advice. Do not burn yourself out. Be as I am, a reluctant enthusiast, a part-time crusader, a half-hearted fanatic. Save the other half of yourselves and your lives for pleasure and adventure. It is not enough to fight for the land. It is even more important to enjoy it while you can, while it is still there. So get out there and mess around with your friends, ramble out yonder, explore the forests, encounter the grizzly, 
climb the mountains, run the rivers, breathe deep of that yet sweet and lucid air. Sit quietly for a while and contemplate the precious stillness, that lovely, mysterious, and awesome space. Enjoy yourselves. Keep your brain in your head and your head firmly attached to your body, the body active and alive. And I promise you this much. I promise you this one sweet victory over our enemies, over those desk-bound people with their hearts in a safe deposit box and their eyes hypnotized by desk calculators. I promise you this. You will outlive the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, yeah, that's a great way to start off this thing. We've got to educate the people. Uh, my first experience in the out of doors was because of my mother. My, my twin brother and I were wrestling in the house. She said, go outside and play. We're breaking up the furniture. and Go outside and play. So we went outside. We're in the Northwest here. What do you do? You climb the trees. You go into vacant lots. 1929, I was born. That's a long time ago. That, there was a real depression. Two twins came into my mom and dad's family. Two twins they had to feed besides another son. But we went through that, and we began to go outside and play. So we'd climb the trees. We'd climb little rocks. We'd scramble like... Jay's looking at these things. We're you know, wow, look at that, look at that, look at that, look at the cloud that looks like an elephant. Look at, you know, look at, and so we began to explore, and we were lucky to be here in the Northwest. But born in West Seattle, we'd walk down to the beach at Lincoln Park, we'd go around, and then, of course, you'd look up, what's that big thing over there that's got all those glaciers on it? Mount Rainier. So I began to climb and do things through the Mountaineers Club and get to people that could teach me how to climb and ski and enjoy the wonderful out of doors that we have here, the wonderful parts of nature. So I began to guide on Rainier. I take people up first to the ice caves on the Paradise Glacier. So I went up and down Mount Rainier 80 times. I've been to the summit 80 times. You learn things when you do that. The glacier, they say 80, yeah, they say you do it something 10 times, you get pretty good at it. Do it a hundred times, you're better. Do it a thousand times, you're beginning to really know what you should be doing. <laughs> and so it takes time, just like walking in the halls of Congress. You got to learn some of that stuff. And I must pay tribute uh, to Jay and, and to Dave, and the people that uh, Governor Dan, to have that ability to walk the forests of the Pacific Northwest and walk down into the halls of Congress to fight those political battles. That takes a special person a real special person, and I'm proud of you. I took Bobby Kennedy up Mount Kennedy in the Canadian Yukon. There was a guy that was going all the way and was, had the courage to do uh, what he had to do, and it takes courage. We're talking about courage. Uh, Churchill said that um, courage is the first and foremost of all human attributes, for with that one attribute, come all the others. So we want our leaders to have that uh, courage, and they do. I had people walk up. <laughs> people come up to me when I was guiding. They'd say, oh, I can't climb. I'm afraid of heights. I'd say, good. You better be, because you'd kill us both if you weren't. <laughs> the reason I'm still alive is because I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> Dan Evans is afraid of heights. He's a climber. We're all afraid of heights uh, because that's why we're still alive. And so you do things because you know you're, what you can do and you learn and begin to grow. When I did this book, A Life on the Edge, it was, uh, I, I wrote, like Nancy said, when you're out of your comfort zone, right, whether it's writing a check or doing anything else, um, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. And when you get out of your comfort zone, it's when you learn the most. And out of your comfort zone in nature, you learn. You better learn because you want to be able to come back down. To get to the top of the mountain is only half the trip. 
you had to get back off the mountain, okay? Um, anyway, so uh, Rainier, then McKinley, and other climbs, then uh, drafted into the, graduated from Seattle U, uh, drafted into the Mountain Cold Weather Command uh, Army for the Korean War and was lucky enough to get transferred to Colorado where I spent two years teaching climbing and skiing to 10 special forces. I was in the military. My, the rest of the whole company is over there in Korea fighting. My brother and I are teaching climbing and skiing in the Rockies. What a deal we had for that. <laughs> what a deal. That was a good deal. So, <clears throat> so um, we did those climbs and began to learn about the Northwest and just enjoyed it tremendously. Um, Everest was another uh, a challenge, and we, uh, uh, we were lucky to pull that one off. There's a lot of luck in climbing, there's luck in politics, there's luck in, we were lucky to be born here. Uh, but Everest was a challenge because you're going to the highest point of Earth. And I know you've looked at the astronauts uh, pictures that they brought back from space and you look at the globe and you see there's a little tiny film of air uh, that circles the globe, thinner than a rind on an on a orange, just a little thin line. And so we went out uh, to see if we could stand on that highest point of Earth. And uh, we did it. We were lucky. We lost one of the team in the ice fall. Uh, but, but we stepped out there. They talk about leadership. Uh, Norman Dernfurth was our leader on that climb, Swiss, Swiss guy and, and uh, American expedition, 19 climbers. Willie Unsold, some of you know from this area, <coughs> was the climbing leader. The climbing leader is smart. Uh, when I was at REI, I try and find the people that were smart to run the company. That, especially in finance and so forth, things that I didn't know about. What you do is get find the smart people and let them get out in front, right? Uh, that's leadership. And so um, uh, the second day in the ice fall, we're looking up at this thing, and Willie Unsold, who was a guide in the Tetons and a great, wonderful person, uh, was the deputy leader on the expedition. <clears throat> we're standing there roped up, and we look at this wall of ice that's about 70 feet of vertical ice with a crevasse separating us from that wall. So to start the climb, first day you gotta jump across the crevasse and hang on that vertical piece of ice before you start climbing uh, to get up it. So we walk up to it and look, look at it and Willie looks at me and I look at him and he said, well, Jim, I guess you're the ice climber on this expedition. <laughs> I said, yeah, Willie, okay. Give me a good belay, will you? <laughs> so he belayed me, and we got up the mountain and stood on the highest point of Earth, 29,028 feet above the sea in the death zone where nothing lives. Nothing. It, there's not enough oxygen to support life. People have climbed it now without bottled oxygen. Ed Beach was my friend, was up there without bottled oxygen. But you don't stay there. You have to get down. You have to get off the mountain. Um, at our press conference in New Delhi, an Indian reporter asked Gambu, the Sherpa I'd climbed with, Gambu, what was the first thing you thought of after having get, gotten to the highest point of Earth? Okay, so we were up there. It was 35 degrees below zero. The winds were 50 miles an hour. We're just hanging on to the top. They said, Gambu, what's the first thing you thought of after getting to that highest point of Earth? I'm sure he expected some eloquent, you know, oh, man, it was just... Gambu answered for me as well when he said, how to get down. <laughs> <laughs> He's a great guy, great, great person.